Hey everyone, Ray Dramas from XY Advisor here. Just a quick message to say thanks very much for signing into our most recent XY social event, Beyond the SOA. You know, compliance and statements of advice are pretty polarizing and really divides opinion in the industry, uh, which is why we chose it as a topic. A lot of advice businesses still believe there's a lot of value in a statement of advice, and there are a lot of advice businesses that go beyond and, and uh, look to put it to one side and do a whole bunch of other things for their clients. So we've got Mia Taylor, Mark Nagel, and Clayton Daniel all together on a panel uh, to talk about their experiences, views, and opinions uh, in terms of what they're doing with statement advice. Thanks very much for signing in, and uh, we hope to see you at the next XY Social. Thanks. Mark's vision for Trace Day is to build a strong presence that can positively influence the Australian financial advice industry and provide the market with a visible and intelligent... <laughs> <laughs> it's bad when you can't even spell intelligent. Uh, alternative to traditional financial advice. <laughs> so next, as I said, they all provide their advice. Clayton Daniel, for I have the pride, the privilege, and the pleasure of introducing you to this night. <laughs> I first met him <laughs> atop a mountain near Jerusalem, praying to God. <laughs> next. He amazed me, still further in Italy, when he saved a fatherless beauty from her dreadful Turkish aunt, uncle. And I remember this distinctly. In Greece, he spent a whole year in silence, just to better understand the sound of a whisper. With no more ado, I give you the seeker of serenity, the protector of Italian virginity, the of the Lord God, the one, the only, Clayton Daniel. <laughs> Do not send me a joke bio. Just don't to anyone else. So today we're talking about going beyond the SOA. So what does that mean uh, for these three people who are in and around our industry? So to start us off, Mia, we'd love to hear about what... Oh, I'll, I'll sit down. Ooh. Oh. Mia, we'd love to hear about... What you guys at Evolesco are doing? Sure, um, it's Evolesco. It's Evolesco. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Say that one up. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, um, being a process-based person, uh, I did want to actually share part of our process tonight, and um, it's what we call our terms of engagement meeting, and it happens after our discovery meeting, but before we present an SOA. And the reason why I thought it was relevant tonight was because it carries more weight and adds more value than simply just presenting an SOA. And rather than talk you through every single step that happens during that meeting, I just wanted to highlight two main parts. One of them being that we've added in what the roadblocks are to clients actually achieving things by themselves. So what they need advisors for. And the three most common things that we've found is time. So our clients don't have the time to dedicate to doing the things that they need to do by themselves. And the other one is fear. So they have this fear of making the wrong decision, so they don't make a decision at all. And then the final one is around paralysis by analysis. So they spend all this time looking online at all the different options that they have available, and then they never actually take any action. So as advisors, it's our job to help them overcome those roadblocks. And we found adding that to our process is really helpful. Um, the other part that I wanted to talk about was around um, how we can better get clients to visualize what it would look like if they did work with us. And what we decided to do was to build an advice timeline. So it's a, um, a timeline of everything that we want them to do, so what their long-term aspirations are and then also what the advice priorities are. So what we're gonna be doing from an advice perspective. And we use lots of images within this document to try and illustrate what it would look like if they do some of those more boring financial things up front, which then means that they can achieve those long-term objectives. So the purchasing of the new car, or the home purchase, or the investment property purchase, whatever it may be. Um, we found by adding in something which is a lot more visual, just helps the client understand how all of the advice fits together. Um, 
I'm just going to take the liberty to move everyone over. As much as I like being the centre of attention, can we just all sit over so everyone can see so you guys do better? Um, you, um, um, okay, Mark, what are you guys doing? And did I say your business name right? Probably not. Yeah, you did. Oh, yes, nailed it. It's a pretty good effort. You made a better job of pronouncing the business name than the rest of the intro. <laughs> a few long words in there, mate. Very um, so, I think... Can, how many advisors do we have in the room? I think the numbers are reasonably good. I'll know relative to the yeah. Yeah, good. So, um, is there any advisor here that thinks that their clients are infused and energised by reading an SOI? Yeah, that's kind of the response I expected. And yet, we've allowed this document to become the centre and dominate the way that we run our businesses. So, you know, why, why has that happened and why are we letting that continue? I think they're big questions. And until we shrink wrap this beast in our businesses and make sure that it doesn't dominate what we do, but it's just ancillary to all of the good stuff, um, I think we're gonna be constrained in terms of the way that we engage our clients. So you have to understand where the, the history of the SOA and the regulations that surround it. Um, but essentially it's a document that's dominated by the licensee um, and legislation, uh, neither of which have your clients particularly in mind. So if you're going to bring the client back to the centre of what you do, and I, if, you know, if you want a great business, you've got to have the client at the centre, right? Um, the SOI needs to be shrink wrapped so that you can do all the really great stuff around it. Um, SOI is not going to go away, compliance is always going to be there, it's going to increase, not decrease. Um, it's there for a reason. We've had a lowest common denominator uh, business model across our industry, unfortunately. You know, if, you, if you're a licensee and you've got you know, 100 advisors, you've got to deal with the guy that's the worst at doing his job, right? So if you're the guy that's the best, you're stuck with the same rules and regulations of the licensee as the worst guy. So, you know, that's not a great business model, which is why I'm an advocate of being self-licensed, so you don't actually have that issue. Um, but, you know, so there's some of the things that have created an SOI, and from my perspective and the way that our business looks at things, um, we are growing way beyond the SOA, we're shrink wrapping it, we're not putting it at the centre of our business, we're not allowing it to dictate the way that we do things, but it's got a use, it has to be there, um, and when we are advising around products and we need an SOA, it becomes an incidental part of what we do, not the driver of what we do. So if you think about all the technology that you have in your business, a lot of that is all around generating a statement of advice. Well, you know, the, the centre of our technology is about client engagement. And yes, we have software that produces a very good and compliant statement of advice. It's Midwinter Julian and Naomi, you know that, it's great. Um, so that's doing a fantastic job for, from a compliance perspective. But, you know, in terms of the way that we engage our clients, we've put client engagement and our client relationship management at the centre of what we do. Um, you know, all of the good stuff isn't in an SOA. The problem is that the processes and procedures that we have in our industry are all about data collection around that stuff, which is low value. So we're really brilliant at recording all of the low value data, and we're really bad at recording all of the good stuff. So that gets lost in the ether, it's just a conversation, right? So the next iteration of tools to support what we do has to help us collect the really good and valuable data and then be able to re-deliver that to our clients to create a richer and deeper experience which feels much more personal to them. So I didn't want it to be a monologue and I'll jump off the soapbox. <laughs> this fella can have the microphone. Okay, good segue. So um, Clayton, the secret of Serenity, what are you doing to go beyond the SOA? Um, when I think of what's beyond the SOA, I think um, First of all, what's in the SOA, and then what's not in the SOA, and how much value 
and advising its people within an SOA and how much they give outside of the SOA. So um, in an SOA, what do you got? An insurance recommendation, a super recommendation, investment portfolio, um, and what's not in uh, an SOA? So you've got an entire relationship with the person where they start making smart decisions based on their trust with you as the advisor. Um, and as that trust and relationship grows, they just automatically start making better decisions. They can go on at any point onto Google, and within two minutes find the solution that they need. But up until the point that they have a, a trusting relationship, they're not gonna make any changes. And the reason for that is, people don't engage with their money on a rational level. They engage with their money on an emotional level. And so you take the role as the advisor of, instead of Google, you connect the person emotionally to their own outcome uh, and then they have a better life. So, could you do that without an SOA? Yeah, you probably could. Um, is it worth doing it without an SOA? Probably not. Um, so, I say that it's worth being a financial advisor, um, even though someone who's not a financial advisor could do it. Because, with being a financial advisor, you automatically have that the things that are in the SOA taken care of. So that that's almost a buy and buy. It's uh, oh, these are the, the functional things that we have to do, which was the birth of the of the industry and yet now is almost the uh, the backstop. So when I think beyond the SOA or even as uh, Peter put it earlier before the SOA um, is she, is she points out that there's a lot that goes on in forming that trust relationship before someone walks in the door. Um, what's crazy is now that in the last couple of months, only a handful of months, less than a handful of months, that I haven't been a financial advisor, um, and I've started doing you know, blogs and, and, and books and, and articles and whatnot, um, more people come to me for advice now than ever. So random people on LinkedIn will just message me or email me uh, on Twitter, everywhere. Now that I've stopped being, now that I'm talking publicly about the things that every single person in this room can talk about because it's not in the SOA, but now I'm just focused on it because I don't have an SOA, um, people are really resonating with it. And it's that whole trust piece, it's the whole engagement, it's the whole relationship piece. Um, so yeah, the, when, when I think about what's beyond the SOA, I, I think about that's the majority of the advice, that's the relationship with the person, that's the education, that's where they're gonna get the value. Um, and yet, someone like myself, who's not an advisor anymore, could never do the role of an advisor. So, it's always totally worth it. Um, I'll, I'll go back to you, Mia. You, you talked about your, you know, within your engagement meeting, you talked about the three roadblocks you, um, you addressed with the client. Um, my question, and we're going to throw up questions to the audience, and we've got roving mics that, that will um, come around with, but my question when you say that, what, what are you finding is like the number one roadblock? That out of the three that you address, what's the number one reason um, people aren't being financially successful on their own? Um, it's definitely that paralysis by analysis. Um, whenever we meet with a client and run through those roadblocks, whenever we say that one thing, we get the head nod and going, that's exactly what I've been doing. They're saying, well, yeah, I, I spent all this time online looking at all these options and I, I spoke to my friend about what I should be doing, but I wasn't sure, so I just haven't done anything. So I thought I'd come to you and try and work out what I should be doing. So I think that that's probably like the number one reason why people aren't doing things by themselves, and that's why they, you know, it's one of the reasons why they do seek advice. Yeah. Totally agree. That's like, that's definitely the one that resonated with me, and I see clients all the time that I pretty much tell them if they leave the meeting and, and they don't become a client, I say that's fine. I'll chase up six months time and just touch base and say, have you done what we talked about? You were going to do. Yeah, and time works as an asset in that way because there's so many clients you meet with them, they won't go ahead at that one point, and then whether it's three months, six months later, you can send that email and you if you use one piece of information that you have and say, oh. How's that going? And then they'll come back to go, and they haven't actually done that. Right? Well, we're going to come and have a chat. Yeah. And so, Mark, I'll, I'll throw over to you. You, you did talk about um, licensing and, and 
compliance being an issue when, when uh, talking about stuff that isn't um, in the, the statement of advice. And, and you talk about you know, self-licensing is, is really a great thing to do, but um, how do we do that when our industry is built up around licensing models? ASIC uh, basically don't really want to sort of become self-licensed. It's a lot more work for them to uh, regulate 18,000 advisors when they can just regulate large licensees. So, so as a whole, we've got a big movement pushing us to, to keep the current model, and you're saying the best way is to uh, move to a model that, that everyone is pushing us away from. How do we manage that as, as a licensed advisor, non-self-licensed? Um, it, it feels like a huge hurdle to go into the self-licensed game. Yeah, look, I, I think that's an urban myth. Uh, it's not difficult to obtain a license, it's not difficult to sustain or service a license. Um, I can't see any advantages of the licensee model, frankly, outside of ASIC having to potentially look after a smaller number of licenses. Um, but you know, it's the bigger licensees that have the issues for that. So in terms of, you know, passing the there saying, well, we don't have the resources to look at all of these individual licensees, they're actually, the, the, the big compliance failures are coming out of the big product houses that have only sustained big licenses because they, it's a distribution channel. So, you know, nobody makes money out of being a licensee without taking margin on product. There's a couple around the edges that are kind of doing okay. Um, but mostly that's a fact, right? So if it's a distribution channel, then, you know, I think it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because, you know, you're creating an environment where the licensee needs to take margin from the product, which in itself creates a compliance issue. So unless you unwind that and you allow everybody to be individually licensed, sure, there's a lot, of more, there's a lot more licenses that you need to regulate. But you're going to unwind the problem because the licensees no longer need to distribute product to make the license financially viable. So it's, once you kind of think that through, it's pretty obvious um, that the current structure isn't right and it's not long-term sustainable. But, I mean, I'm going to push back on that because aren't you being a little bit disingenuous saying it's, it's an urban myth that self-licensing is, isn't that hard? Because You've got to think about the support networks that a licensee can provide, the technology that they can provide, the compliance updates. Like, do do I really want to be reading ASICs for you know updates? Um, so there is a lot of support that licensees can provide a small single advisor business. Um, okay, here's an idea. <laughs> how <laughs> how about a business that supplies? Full service suite to an advice business without being a licensee. Yeah. It's not rocket science. And somebody's going to do it, somebody's going to do it pretty soon. And when they do it, it's going to be very disruptive. And it's going to be a fantastic next step in what we do. Um, you know, you can put all of the tools together without being a licensee. So you remove that conflict. But what you're doing is actually providing a whole bunch of really great services to advisors, stuff that they really need. So if you want to put a CRM in the middle of your business, and you want to use something like Salesforce, for example, that's really expensive. So if you can't organise some group buying around that, it's really, you're not going to be able to do it. Right? So it's really hard to improve your business model unless you have a supplier it's prepared to deliver services without it being hooked to a license that requires you to sell your product. Yes, again, I mean, just so everyone's aware, Ben told me, Phil, you won't see because you're going to push back on them. So, so <laughs> that's what I'm just doing. Not played in that yeah. uh, <laughs> but, but isn't that what a licensee is? They, they group by all the technology but, and then tacking on that and making sure advisors are compliant, but then taking on that license is, is really a small part of the, that service offering. So if there was a, a separate company that did all of that without the license, um, wouldn't they be charging the same fee as, as a licensee? 
Yeah, quite possibly, and that's commercially reasonable. Um, but what you're getting is you're getting a delivery of services that help you grow your business and help you have better relationships with your clients versus a model where you're not getting any of those things. You're getting delivered a suite of services designed to protect the licensee, not give a good experience to your clients. It makes no sense. I agree. Um, well, let's go to a question. Full disclosure, I, like Mike, have decided to go self-licensed. But I think there is every opportunity in license land. But can I please ask that you stop letting your dealer groups treat you like children? We allow them to be our parents, and it is not appropriate. They're a service provider. A fabulous one, potentially, but we allow them to talk to us like we are secondary to them, when in fact they're just another service provider like all the other ones you use. And if we change that dynamic in the industry, I think the compliance stuff will start to change a little bit. I think the attitude will start to change because we'd be saying, this document is not good enough, fix it, instead of, all oh, right, it's what I've got to do. So I think you can absolutely change. You can stay as a, a, a person within a dealer group. I actually think for some people it's perfect. But I think we need to demand more constantly of those groups that we're allowing to define the future of our business. Yeah, Peter, I don't, I don't think that's going to work because of the lowest common denominator model. So clearly you're correct, but if you've got, you know, if you're the licensor, if you have 50 of you, great business, but you don't, one of you have 49 others, right? So it's about the worst of those 50. That's where the compliance comes from. So whilst that exists, whilst the licensee is taking the risk for the advice, you're going to be compromised. So, moving on to claiming, is compliance, so I, it was a facetious bio, but claim's no longer an advisor. So is compliance a reason you left advice? It played a big role, definitely. Um, compliance, if compliance was this, if compliance was a better result for clients, uh, I'd be all for it. Um, but as you just alluded to, it's normally just to protect the people, which you don't really want to say, unless you feel like standing up to them. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I just found myself doing a bunch of stuff which was all about the dealer group rather than the client. And the, and the strange thing was the more I got focused on the client and the more tailored the advice got to the client, and the more I stepped out of the framework, the more compliance became a problem. And I thought, that's a broken model. Um, if I was smart enough, I probably would have just self-licensed. <laughs> so we've got, a, we've got a question from Dan Nash. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll give you a question. I'll direct this one at Nagali, because uh, I know he's, uh, you know, has a tendency to become opinionated about certain things. Um, but, okay, so we agree that there's all this work that we do outside the SOA, that's the real value, the SOA document's a compliance document, it doesn't really add value. So, I suppose the question is, what's the solution? Is it that we make uh, the SOA simpler? Is it that we have no SOA? Is it, you know, what, what does a, a forward-thinking, modern advisor, like, how do they solve this problem to, you know, continue to add value without being burdened by compliance, but then, you know, to, to ensure that uh, consumers are protected? Yeah, so I, I think you just, you do that by putting the SOA in its place. So I think a, uh, I think a modernised advice business will have less licensed advisors and more advisors that are not licensed doing the great stuff. And you're going to will the product guy in. So, you know, um, with, with Clayton's uh, business model, there's so many advantages around that. You have this inherent weakness because you can't deliver on the product when it's required. And let's be honest, it's often required, right? So you need to be able to pull somebody in to just discharge the compliance piece. So, I think you can, I think what we're going to see is a shift in the balance of the way that we start our businesses. Um, and yeah, the SOA will always be there and it should be because when you are moving products, you need to make sure that that's 
best interest, not remuneration stuff. Mm. But you know, we are out there kind of creating a new category here, right? So I think that's a good thing because 80% of adult Australians do not like what we do. They're not hearing us, they don't use us, it makes no sense. If we kind of have the, uh, the courage to evolve and to create this new segment, we're going to service way beyond the 20% that we currently do, and the SOI will be just a shrink-wrapped component of that. So, and, and just to follow up, and I'd like to hear it from, the, from the, other, the others on this as well, but like, do we just accept that the SOA is always going to be a boring, long, cumbersome document, or is there a better solution? We don't need to accept that it's a boring, long, cumbersome document, because that is your licensee and their lawyers that create that asset. Do not want or advocate 100 page SOAs. Okay, so you're self licensed and you've spent time thinking about your SOA. Do you think that your SOA is amazing and just blows people's minds when you present it to them? No, and it's not designed to be. Absolutely not. So is there a better solution or what? Yes, there is because you, I think that, you know, we're evolving to a point where there's more than one document. So, you know, we will be producing guidebooks, which is more about well-being, happiness, lifestyle, satisfying other areas of a client's life. And the SOA will be put in its place, so it will not be the dominant document. Um, so I don't sit here, Ben, saying we've done all this stuff and we've got it all right. What I'm confident about is the direction that we're moving in, and uh, and I think that there will be two documents, and the life document, the guidebook, whatever you choose to call that, will be all of the really fantastic stuff. But where it starts is you need the, you need the systems and the processes within a business to be able to collect the great stuff. Like that right now, that doesn't exist. All we're collecting is the technical stuff because it feeds into the SLA and that gets rammed down to the client and you've left all of the conversation on the table which is kind of a tragedy, right? Because that's where all the good stuff is. But there isn't, there are not the tools currently available to be able to absorb that, use that data and regurgitate it to create a richer experience for the client. Okay, we've got another audience question over here. Um, I just wanted to ask, of, um, did you keep on referring it to the SOA as the centerpiece? Why? Why do you think it's a centerpiece? Why have you made it the centerpiece? We haven't made it the centerpiece. I think the I think I think more historically. As I, advice. I'm talking about the centerpiece. Yeah. 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 We have made it's it. the centerpiece stop. Yeah. So yeah. 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 I mean because I tend to view my SOA as kind of more like my TV manual. It's there, it's, you know, had to be gone through. But realistically you're right, it needs to be kind of like short, concise and you know, give the value. But there's still no solution. Um, I think I think that there, the solutions are on the way. Um, but yeah, at this point, when I say about the SI being a centerpiece, I talk about the industry in general, not necessarily individual businesses. I know a lot of indivi individual businesses that are really lucky in that trend and they're trying to do some really great things. But like I said, it's, it's almost a new category, right? So you've got to commercialise that the SLA traditionally has been the place where the revenue is generated. Okay, so let's move tracks a little bit. Clayton, I want to um, ask you this question. So, uh, you know, there's an industry stat, 20% of people are receiving advice. You said when you started, uh, when you stopped giving advice, you started doing more uh, blogging content, more people were asking you questions. Do you think that's because you were just being more widely helpful? Um, and do you think that as an industry, to attract more than 20%, we need to be thinking outside of just the people who are paying us money, and we need to be more helpful? Yeah, the weird thing about financial advice is we consider ourselves different from every other industry. It's the weirdest thing, like if you just look outside of financial advice, the way that business works is you attract a client base because you educate an uneducated consumer. Like it's, it's really not that difficult, but we, we don't think like that for some reason. Um, so if you spent, if everyone spent their time educating the uneducated, then you're just going to be 
the place to go to. And I, I mean, if you read the book The Lotion, like that's all, that's all, that's that's about. That's not a new, a new thing. But witnessing it now in my own life it is a weird thing. But I just want to quickly touch on Ben's question about the SOA. Um, I think. What, where's the SOA come from? The SOA, is, if you go back 20 years, it was a one page handwritten document. And then a bunch of people got ripped off, and then uh, all this standard text filled in. Over time, it just lumped on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other. And that was through um, confliction in remuneration. So as conflicts drop, why do we still need all the standard text? Um, it's going to get to a point where five years from now, a lot of conflicts are going to be born. And why do we, you know, basically the SOA is almost, especially come from an aligned model, it's just a bunch of graphs and standard text to say, oh, it's sweet, I can just stick you there. Like, that's the point, right? But if, if there's no APL, um, then there's no conflicts, and then there's, you know, there's commissions. Um, which caused a lot of the problems in the first place, especially with investments, and that's gone now, right? So you can't earn commissions from investments. So a lot of conflicts are gone, especially if you got rid of the APL and products were open. Um, I, I think, yeah, you could shrink an SOA massively. And as Mark said, that's what ASIC want to see. Totally. So, so moving back to the direction that I wanted to take it, um, <laughs> Mia, I know you guys in the Lesco. Close enough. Um, <laughs> you guys do a lot of workshop with clients, potential clients, um, and is that your um, philosophy around it? Is let's be helpful, let's give information, let's educate the uneducated. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the SOA document is a product and compliance document, and it comes right at the end. So um, we're so focused on how we can get people more engaged with financial advice, understand that there is a need for it, and then you know, gently bring them in and then sort of really probe deep into what is it that they really want in life. And then how can financial advice maximise the probability of their outcomes being achieved? So we, yeah, we're massively focused on what can be done before you ever even get to an SOA, which is really just what products do they need to be able to help them on their journey. And in your bio, one thing I really love is uh, helping you empower people to become healthier, wealthier, and happy clients. Yeah. Um, we've got a question. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, the gentleman mentioned a bit earlier that uh, at the moment, financial planners is focusing on the top 20% of uh, income earners. And, uh, no? You said top 20%? Only 20% I mean, get advice. Only 20% advice, okay. Um, I, I hear that myself. I ordered a lot of boutique AFSLs. And a lot of them, you know, whether they like it or not, tend to target the top 20%. What sort of strategy can you um, bring in that will expand that to maybe the top 50%? Uh, right, the bottom 50% may not have disposable income to invest and you may not be able to have value, but I might be wrong because I'm not a planner. Let's, let's go to Clayton with that one. What do you, what do, you do? I was expecting Mark to answer. <laughs> That's why I asked you, Mark. What, what do you think we can do as an industry? Uh, to do... To target... Not to broaden the offering to... Oh, uh, right, 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 right. right. Uh, the top 50% as opposed to the top so, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you were nervous then. Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, cash flow. So cash flow is a massive thing um, and you can... If you, you say someone doesn't have a lot of money, traditionally funds under management, uh, no great client. Um, but if someone's a, um, his name calls them a Henry, high earning, not rich yet. Um, so they're, they're great clients as well. So and that's just based on um, being able to help them with their cash flow. And there's a lot you can go into it, but um, more than just monitoring and, and pointing out where they're spending their money, you can actually control it as well. And, and just being helpful, like, as advisors, we can just, like, actually care about what clients want um, and what they need and just help them achieve that and charge them a fee for it. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Sounds silly, but... Um, okay. Um, so, Mark, you, talk, you touched on tech. 
um, and and we will go into a little bit of tech because you said you know Salesforce. I, I don't have a business where I can jump into a half a million dollar Salesforce um, solution. Solution. So. Um, how do the smaller, newer businesses kind of deal with the tech side of running a really efficient financial planning firm? Yeah, I think it's a big challenge. Um, the solutions I don't think exist right now in terms of, I don't think that there's a service provider that has a holistic offering of tools without it being attached to a license. We're seeing an emergence of that in the US. Um, where the model is slightly different, um, and I am pretty pretty sure that in time there will be providers in Australia that offer a more holistic range of services, which are not centred around the requirements of a licensee to protect their license from a compliance perspective. So that's that's an issue, right? Because everything that the licensee buys and then provides to, their, to the end user being the advisor is about their license protection. Because it's designed by the licensee, so you know, the SLA template goes into that. Uh, unless you're uh, self-licensed, where you can go back to the provider and work with them to, to get improved templates, you're kind of stuck with it, right? Because nobody's doing anything different at the beginning. There are, there are licensees out there that are beginning to understand that they need to provide a suite of tools and a value proposition which isn't aligned to the distribution of product. So it's beginning to occur, but it doesn't exist right now. Well, Phil, I'm just going to jump in there with a comment. Um, just two things. Um, open architecture, plug and play with everything that is available, that's what you'll look for, and Zapier. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you can't get him away from it. Um, and Mike, just if you raise it to you, yeah, because the guys up the back can't quite. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Jess Brent. Yeah, Jess. Is that okay? Sorry, of course. Cool. Um, I'm interested in, so the SLA is obviously the upfront engagement piece, and whether it works or not is obviously being debated. What, and Clayton, probably less relevant for you unless you want to talk about pre sale. Um, what are you doing specifically to continue to engage and educate your clients once you've onboarded them and they've been clients of yours for perhaps a number of years? Fantastic question. Go, ma'am. Um, well, we've sort of built in um, that cash flow um, coaching. So we're having more contact with our clients after they decide that they want to become a client and you go through the whole process and have signed off in the SOA. Um, so we're having a bit more conversation with our clients on an ongoing basis. So we provide them with monthly reporting, so that way on a monthly basis we can check in on them and say, well, you know, if you're on the budget, do you need to come in for another conversation? And when it comes to the, um, what else we can be educating them on, we're, we're offering um, seminars to our clients, and it's with the healthy, wealthy, happy kind of offering that we have. Um, it's not just financial planning based seminars, so we're sort of building a service offering that um, gets our clients to come in to learn a little bit more about other areas of their life that might be of interest and, and then also tap on the you know, financial planning sort of update as well. Yes, yeah, so I want to kind of go back and think about yourself as a consumer and how you get value from anybody that provides a service to you. One of the issues that we have at the moment is that because of the, the SOI being centric to what we do and the way that we collect the data right up front with our initial meetings, is that you actually, even though you have great conversations with your clients, all of the gold is left in the ether as a conversation. You've only collected the low value stuff so when you start to provide an ongoing service, it's dictated by the dollar that you've collected. So if you think about the hugely successful businesses around the planet at the moment, they're people that are collecting very detailed information about your life. And they regurgitate that to you in terms of value. So unless you have a process that allows you to collect rich data up front, providing deeper and more meaningful engagement down the track is going to be really tough. Right? So unless you can fix that part, unless you're able to 
grab the gold, use that data and then be able to regurgitate it as a service offering, you're going to be behind the eight ball. So now until that's fixed, until you can really understand how you can hold that data in the same way that Facebook does, it's probably a really great example, um, they can push stuff back to you that's highly relevant because they know so much about what you do. You're in a great position, our industry is in a fantastic position. We know so much more about our clients than a lot of other people, right? I mean, outside of probably a doctor, we collect, and, and sometimes we get that through insurances, right? So we are really at the, at the forefront of collecting the most rich data from our clients, but we have nowhere to put it. Right now, we have nowhere to put it, we have no way to sort it, and we have no way to regurgitate it to create that uh, engagement down the track. So that's a perfect segue for me, Mark, because one of the most popular topics we talk about in the XY Advisor Facebook group, and if you're not in it, go to xyadvisor.com forward slash community and join up, uh, is technology. Uh, people love talking about tech, what new tech we're using. Um, and data collection is all about having a technology solution to be able to capture that data and regurgitate it. Um, so just quickly before we wrap up, uh, I'd love to hear what tech all of you are using in your businesses um, and claim uh, how are you collecting data um, from with regards to your book. Yeah. Um... Yeah. That's that's pretty much the top one at the moment. Um, I'm not great with tech. But I'll I'll outsource that question to Andrew and Patty. <laughs> Oh, well, so we, we have Salesforce as our CRM, um, which has been a big investment to get that to do what we want it to do. Um, we have Midwinter beautifully shrink wrapping the SOR. So it does exactly what we need it to do, and it has given it the right proportion within our business. So we don't have this huge piece of software that's designed to do a whole bunch of stuff that we're never going to use. Um, we've, we've put it in context and, um, and Midwinter delivers on that for us very well. Um, we are currently using XPlan as our CRM and we Straight use... Straight Midwinter. <laughs> we're currently using, you know, always under review. Um, and uh, we, we, will, we use Asana for tasking, so not so much just the data collection. Um, infusion soft for marketing and um, Slack for talking to each other in the office. Awesome. Um, so we're going to wrap up. I hope uh, you've really enjoyed this session. I know I have. So can we just give our panellists a round of applause? <laughs> Midwinter as sponsors have also generously donated everyone a copy of Clang's new book, um, Fund Your Ideal Lifestyle. So uh, we were talking about being helpful clients and uh, a type of book like this is infinitely helpful to clients so uh, grab your copy on your way out after you've made sure we've um, really damaged the bill on the bar so <laughs> stick around Adrian tried to scare you off before but I'm here to encourage you to really go to town so one last round of applause and thank you very much